much of an impact would it make if everyone stopped eating meat? Oh, if everyone stopped eating meat, it would have a tremendous impact. We could benefit greatly by just eating lower on the food chain. If you look at the energy uh, requirements to raise a, you know, a, a cow, right, or a steer, it's immense. Uh, and we'd be much, uh, much better off not, not eating the cow, but eating the things that the cow eats, for example. Um, the same thing with a lot of different, uh, different you know, animals that we raise. Uh, we could all go much, much better off by eating lower in the food chain because of the energy requirements. How much time do we have before climate change makes growing food and living on the planet just too difficult? Well, I, uh, I think that's kind of a loaded question because you can always grow something. Um, at some level, carbon dioxide acts as a fertilizer, right? You can actually, uh, uh, this is what plants take in is carbon dioxide, but that only works to a certain level. Um, Crop habits or, uh, may have to change. Agricultural habits may mean, need to change. What used to grow here might not grow here, so you have to grow something else. Um, I don't see that we're looking towards uh, some situation where you can't grow anything. I mean, unless the earth started to boil or something like that, and that's not going to happen. But agricultural practices will change, and we'll have to adapt to that. If everyone cooperated and agreed to work together, are there technologies today that can remove greenhouse gases from the air and stop or significantly slow down climate change? Well, as I mentioned before, there are, there's a lot of research in what you call sequestration, right? Take the carbon dioxide uh, out uh, before it gets out of the smokestacks, things like that. Um, there's a lot of ideas out there, a lot of work out there. Um, it would be a very difficult thing to do. Um, again, I think I said it before, I think the smarter option uh, is to just reduce your greenhouse gas growth uh, by going to uh, different ways of, of, of you know, energy production. And if we do that, the climate will come back to what it was. Um, if we could get a handle on our greenhouse gas emissions right now, we'll be living with a warmer planet, but a planet that we can handle. We'll still have an Arctic sea ice cover. Uh, we'll, we'll still be okay, but the issue is getting a handle on it now, otherwise it's gonna catch you. If nothing changes in the way humans live, what do you believe the planet will be like in, say, 2029, 2039, 49, 2059, or 2069? Well, if we, if we can, can continue going on this path we're doing right now, sort of like a burn baby burn scenario. Yeah, you're looking at a, a warmer and progressively warmer world. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, some areas with uh, shortages of food and water. You're going to be looking at higher sea levels. Uh, you're going to be looking at probably uh, having to shift agricultural practices. So again, it's something that we'd leave our children and our grandchildren uh, a planet that is less habitable uh, but uh, again, we can stop this. Uh, we can put a halt to this. It's going to take a while. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but let's not uh, throw up our hands and say all is lost because it's not. If there was unlimited money and total cooperation between countries, what technologies, solutions, products exist to reverse climate change or take greenhouse gases out of the environment? Well, we've already talked about taking greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, but in terms of limiting your greenhouse gas growth, uh, at this conference we've heard a number of solutions. Solar, I mean solar power is just growing in leaps and bounds, and wind. Now wind energy is basically secondhand solar because of course it's the sun that eventually drives the wind, so it's secondhand solar really. Uh, those two alone uh, have tremendous potential and are growing in leaps and bounds. Um, out in Colorado, where I live, we have big wind farms. Well, no one's doing that out of altruism. Someone's making money on those, but it's part of the solution. And the other thing, we can be so much more efficient how we use energy. Uh, we've already made inroads in that. We used to have incandescent bulbs. Now we've gone to LEDs, which are so much more efficient. We're on a better path in that way. We just have to pursue these paths much more aggressively than we are today. Richard Oppenlander and others say the most powerful thing we can do to stop climate change is stop eating animal products. Is this true? And if so, why aren't more people speaking about this? Well, um, yes, if we stop eating animal products, it would be a huge uh, improvement because I've mentioned before the energy requirements to raise, say, a pound of beef or something like that is just tremendous. 
Uh, so we'd be much better off in doing that. Uh, how that would compare to other measures, like going for in terms of electrical production for solar, wind, I can't say. That's not my area of expertise, uh, but absolutely it would make a huge impact. Well, in terms of the energy production, say, uh, to raise a pound of beef, so what do you have to do? Well, first of all, uh, you have to grow what the cattle are going to eat, which is usually corn, feed corn. Uh, well, of course, you've got to uh, plow your field, you've got to plant those fields, you've got to raise that, a lot of chemical fertilizers, a lot of using that, nitrogen. Uh, then you've got to harvest that all, and now you've got to ship it all to your cattle, which then eat that. Uh, at every step of the way, it's very energy intensive to do something like that. Where does that energy come from? Burning gasoline or something like that. So there's all these different steps in the production of beef, all of which take a lot of energy to deal with. And that's where the problem lies. Um, if we instead just ate the corn directly, not that that's really good corn to eat, that you know, cattle corn, but you get what I mean. Um, if, if we uh, grew the plants and ate those instead of using those to feed the animals to produce the meat, we'd be a lot better off. Uh, tell me how you see the next 30 years if nothing changes in the way the world produces greenhouse gases. Um, well, if nothing, let's, let's just say, we're, I think the question is, is that what will happen in the next 30 years if we really don't do anything about our greenhouse gas growth? And as I mentioned before, we're just looking at a progressively warmer world. Uh, we're looking at the Arctic sea ice cover probably disappearing in summer. We're looking at a higher sea level because the Greenland ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet, Arctic and Antarctic ice caps and glaciers will be melting down. We'll be seeing some areas with intensified drought, uh, some areas with intensified precipitation uh, events, uh, increased forest fires in some uh, areas. So basically, uh, in a sense, you see sort of weather on steroids, uh, in a sense here. And that's the path that we'll be on um, in terms of things like uh, more intense droughts, uh, more intense uh, precipitation events. We have to remember that in a warmer atmosphere, you can hold more water vapor in the atmosphere, so you're going to have an intensified hydrologic cycle. You'd say, well, it rains a lot out here. Actually, it makes it drier out here for some of the, the same reasons. So it's a, it's a complicated thing, but that's the path we're going to be on. What action should we immediately take to stop climate change from progressing, and is that even possible? Well, as I mentioned before, yes, we can stop climate change. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not immediate. Um, it will take time. See, the problem is, is that carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere stays there for a long time. And so as long as it's there, it's going to keep us out of what we call a balance, a radiative balance, and the planet will keep heating up. It takes a while for that carbon dioxide to be drawn out of the atmosphere. Uh, but if we let it, nature take its course, it will draw it out of the atmosphere. We just got to give nature a chance. Uh, and that means stop loading the atmosphere with carbon dioxide. If we can do that, the planet will come back. And uh, it's not too late. We can do that now. It'll take a while. Hey, but we'll be okay. What are the most important steps humans can take to stop climate change? The important steps that humans can take to stop climate change is changing your, uh, your power production. Um, for uh, electrical production, uh, you, you need to go solar, you need to go wind. Um, now you, you talk about something like nuclear, okay? Nuclear is a very controversial issue, very controversial issue because you have to deal with that nuclear waste. Uh, but I'm a pragmatist. I say choose your poison. What's worse? You burn fossil fuels and you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or you deal with nuclear, with nuclear waste issues. Choose your poison. The point is nothing comes for free. Even building solar, even building wind takes energy to do that. Uh, it's not a matter, there's no magic or what you call silver bullet here. What we have is intelligent choices that we can make. But uh, going to solar, going to wind, Changing how we eat, uh, we talked about going to eating lower on the food chain. And uh, very, very important, simple conservation. We can be so much more efficient on the energy that we use. Those things in combination, uh, if we could do that as a species, we're going to be okay. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on conflicts between countries, shortages, and why does this matter? 
Well, you're seeing from what I understand, I'm not an expert on this, but in terms of uh, how climate change is related to growing conflict, there's hints that it's emerging in some areas. My specialty is in the Arctic, and what you're seeing up there is that climate change and geopolitics are becoming intertwined. Um, we see that Russia uh, is really benefiting from uh, a warmer Arctic because there's less ice. So what are they doing? Uh, they're going gung-ho in producing oil and natural gas because there's a lot of oil and natural gas at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, with less ice, uh, it raises uh, possibilities of conflict. Our Navy, for example, is very much aware uh, that we've got an Arctic now with less ice that they're going to have to deal with. Um, are we going to see conflicts arise? Um, hopefully not, uh, but we'll see. And in many ways, the Arctic is kind of this microcosm, this kind of uh, uh, example of, of some of the issues that are now emerging where climate change and geopolitics get tied together. But we'll see. Hopefully, as a species, we've uh, matured a little bit and uh, we'll be able to handle this. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on extinction of other species, and why does that matter? Yeah, well, in terms, of, if we change the climate, um, we are going to see some species that are not going to do well and may die out, it's already been happening, and we are going to see some that are going to do just fine, right? It's, it's interesting that even if you look today, uh, a num lots of different species have adapted very well to people, right? Squirrels, right? Crows, <laughs> all kinds of things, others not so well. Um, in the climate change uh, area, what you, there's going to be winners and there are going to be losers. Again, my specialty is the Arctic. The Arctic vegetation is changing, tundra being taken over by shrubs, willows, things like that. Um, if you're a caribou, uh, you're saying, I don't like this, this is not good for me. If you're a moose that likes eating willows, things like that, they're saying, oh, this is fine, this is great for me. You see, there's winners and there's losers in this. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on flooding and rising water tables, and why does this matter? Yes, well, one of the things that we're seeing already in the United States, for example, there's very good statistics on this, that the frequency of what we call extreme precipitation events uh, is changing, more ex precipitation extremes. And this goes back to what I said before. We're warming up the atmosphere. That atmosphere can now hold more water vapor, but if it's going to precipitate, you've got to have water vapor in the atmosphere. So more water vapor in the atmosphere, the potential for bigger precipitation events. And there's good statistics to back up that this is uh, already happening. So that does raise the issue of floods and things like that. On the other extreme, uh, we also see areas that are dry are probably going to become drier. Uh, and so, for example, you look at the big wildfires out in the West, it appears to be a combination of things. One of them is poor forest practices. Another one is it's getting warmer, so it's getting drier. So you see these things connecting with each other. Uh, in coastal areas, of course, a big uh, concern is uh, sea level rise because we're melting the Greenland ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, glaciers and ice caps around the world, and the ocean is warming, which means it expands a bit, uh, and that contributes to sea level rise. Uh, we don't have to worry about it in Colorado, where I'm from, uh, but uh, if you're uh, in New York City or New Orleans, uh, Miami's already dealing with issues of sea level rise.